Thank you, thank you. It's wonderful to be here today. Um, I, I did want to add that um, actually I left NASA nine years ago uh, with a commitment to try to change the world to allow more people to have the experiences and have the capabilities that come from uh, what we can do in space. And so I had the opportunity to do uh, some work on space policy with the commercial space regulator in the United States and was also um, uh, an executive at DARPA working on advanced space technology and how to advance the commercialization of space. And I think that's what I'd really like to focus on um, initially, is to talk about um, the fact that the space industry is growing around the world. Uh, this is um, an image of all the space agencies in the world. Um, there are two that have been added since then, Croatia and Australia. So um, it's obviously a growing industry, but what's really happening is there's an awareness that the government plays a critical role in assisting industry going forward and nurturing and creating a central coordination function and also creating policies that are of benefit to grow that space industry. Uh, so I'd just like to say I just came back from IAC and um, uh, Dr. Clark totally rocked uh, everyone. They really loved her. Uh, we came out of a panel together and um, I, I heard um, a young uh, person from Germany say, oh man, the head of your agency is really cool. <laughs> I thought that was wonderful. I just had to show this picture of the Australian booth. A year ago, the Australian Space Agency was announced by the government, and um, I was a little bit concerned that we would keep that momentum. And I'm happy to say that this was the best place to be uh, of all the booths. Um, it was completely overwhelmed by uh, Australians from around the world who were proud of the place that they had to be, um, but also um, um, it was also the best cocktail party. Just saying, Megan. So obviously the key goal of the space agency is a, uh, an attempt to triple Australia's nascent space industry. This is a fantastic goal. It's, it's really worthwhile for Australia uh, to get on the train, not just because uh, the space industry is a growing industry, but because your other industries need space to take the next step and they need to be competitive in the world as people are beginning to understand space capabilities. Earlier, um, it was referred to the fact that satellite communications are supporting remote asset management, and that's a great example of that. So some of the implications of this, though, is that industry has to play a very key role in this. Right? So the government doesn't close a business case, industry closes a business case. And so there's got to be a leveraging of key capabilities. And we've heard about the geographic and technical capabilities, so I don't need to emphasize that again. Um, but I do want to um, focus on a specific area for a moment. So there's all kinds of things that Megan is working on, the space agency is trying to do. I'm not gonna read these all to you. I wanna say what I really wanna focus on is the area of international partnerships. So why are international partnerships really important? They're crucially important in space especially. First of all, still, even though there's a growing industry, the government uh, and, and governments and nations around the world, really the policies and the laws uh, and the business uh, frameworks are set up to support government agencies. And as a result, there's some real challenges. We heard about some of the space law and policy challenges around debris. But as a result, the partnerships between countries are what typically enable industry. So I've got a couple of examples here, CubeSats uh, that are from other countries being uh, taken up to the International Space Station and um, sent out into space. That's how Planet Labs got their first uh, start in business. Um, of course, uh, the Novasar sat that was uh, mentioned earlier, the partnership with uh, CSIRO and ESA, um, and of course, uh, a really common form of uh, cooperation is to have payloads on board uh, rovers like the Mars 2020 rover, and um, they're incredibly uh, ca uh, capable things to do. But I'd like to point out that the ultimate partnership is the International Space Station itself. So the power of an international partnership, like the International Space Station, is that each country 
brings a piece of its capability. And for the small investment that they make, they get access to the entire investment. So you're really maximizing the bang for the buck that you get for the research that you do, the things that you support, you have the ability to have access to all of the science and technology. Now, in addition to this, it's a crucial part of building an industry because what happens is your industry in your country begins to partner with industry in other countries to build this capability. So our scientists do a great job of coordinating with each other, but it can, there can be a lot of barriers to companies working together around the world. So these key introductions, these key partnerships, the government plays a crucial role in bringing country, companies together who then go on and do fully commercial things themselves. And we're beginning to see that in space. But the first step is really about government partnerships. So uh, Megan did a wonderful job earlier of talking about all the individual areas uh, of uh, research and technologies that uh, the Australian Space Agency thinks that Australia should be focused on. But I'd like to talk about two specific areas. So the good news is I've had a lot of speakers ahead of me talk about remote asset management, talk about robotics, um, and that's very helpful. And I'm just going to do a little bit of a deeper dive in that area. So uh, there's a lot of space startups and a lot of interesting things going on. In fact, I'm leading a trade delegation to the United States of, of near-term opportunities. Uh, in fact, if you're interested, check out the AmCham website, and uh, we'll be meeting with a lot of space companies in the United States in November. But we have to have a longer-term strategic vision. So where is the rest of the world going? They are going towards the moon and Mars. So that's the next big step in deep space exploration sending humans, but also sending robots and uh, preparing ourselves to go to Mars long term. So uh, in order to take the next step, NASA is working on a lunar orbiting platform uh, called a gateway. And the intent is that this will be a human tended, not full time presence uh, vehicle that is in orbit around the moon that supports landers that can go down to the moon and also supports the research and technologies that we need to go on to Mars. So this is kind of the next big thing after the International Space Station. So where does remote asset management play a part in this? It's absolutely going to be a critical part. Uh, this lunar orbiting platform uh, offers that potential path forward. It's going to have to start with an international agreement. It's that that will have to be uh, a part of it. Um, in addition to that, we have to tailor existing capabilities to go towards uh, space. So one of the challenges um, that, that I think is out there is to bring the companies that have remote asset management capability, what will drive them to the table? Well, I see two things. Uh, the first thing is that uh, space is already a part of their remote asset management, right? Satellite communications. But even more importantly, taking the next steps will allow a cross flow of technologies from aerospace technologists into the energy resources mining areas and a cross flow back of this tremendous capability into space. I'll just tell you a short story about why this is so important. Building the International Space Station was a big part of my career, and it was really challenging and interesting to try to figure out how we were going to launch one piece at a time, and then we attached uh, the next piece, then we had to completely reboot uh, all of the software and generate a whole new software system because the station had grown right in front of us as we'd attached a piece. So NASA did a really good job of thinking that through with all their international partners. And then the time came to sustain it. And we had all kinds of visiting vehicles from all over the world, from Japan, from Europe, from the US, from Russia. And we had a serious traffic jam. No one had thought about how to manage having those docking and undocking and all of the individual constraints that came with it, the number of attachment points, uh, the individual physical constraints for the vehicle for docking. Some are robotically caught and then birthed. Some are automatically birthed. Uh, some needed people. Uh, some did not need people. 
and uh, trying to work around that. It's a great example of why any kind of space station that's going to be sustained in the future, whether it's a commercial station in low Earth orbit, whether it's the lunar or orbiting platform, or another thing, is going to need this remote asset management capability. And I'd like to propose that what we really need is an institute for remote asset management in hostile environments and bring together industry that has this capability with our researchers, with space experts, to promote that cross flow of technologies. And I'd love to see remote asset management from Australia be a key part of the lunar orbiting platform. And there's more. The next step is to go on to a moon village concept. So building a scientific research facility on the surface of the moon. This has been proposed by ESA. It's a very interesting idea. One challenge with the International Space Station is everything had to happen in a certain sequence. And so if one piece wasn't ready, everybody had to stand down and wait. And, and we saw that happen. Uh, we saw delays in one element cause delays in all the following elements. So the idea of Moon Village is instead it's a loose collection of independent facilities where you're still close enough to go next door and borrow a cup of oxygen should you need it, but you're not in each other's critical path. So what's it going to take to make Moon Village occur? Well, there's another piece of this, and it's autonomous mining. So um, the Honorable Julie Bishop talked about asteroid mining, which is a very exciting area, but it's still pretty far out. I think mining on the moon is going to be incredibly important. So there are tremendous resources. Number one, water. We have recently discovered, our scientists worldwide working together have discovered there's water. So water is really important to keep humans alive, uh, cooling for experiments, and it's also rocket fuel. So that means that if you can create and extract water, it's one less kilo of propellant you have to lift all the way from the surface of the Earth and take to the moon. So this is going to be really important in a vibrant uh, transportation ecosystem all the way out to Mars. Rare Earth metals, tons of them on the moon. So there's a potential for an economic return that's quite significant. I'd also like to mention um, a lunar regolith just to you know, dig things up to uh, compact and make into structures and also for radiation shielding. And a little bit further out, helium-3, uh, which uh, the existence of uh, was first proposed by an Australian uh, many decades ago. It has been found here on Earth, but it's very rare. It's ubiquitous on the moon, and it is a non-radioactive fusion nuclear power source. So that is a potential to bootstrap into a tremendous capability power generation on the moon. So I think, again, it's going to have to start with the international agreements. I think uh, there also has to be um, uh, substantial coordination. Uh, we have to space qualify that hardware. So the autonomous mining equipment uh, has to be uh, ruggedized for vacuum, uh, an extremely harsh environment. You have one of the world's uh, leading uh, moon dust experts, uh, Dr. Brian O'Brien, who can help you with that and to figure out how to take that next step. So um, uh, power source is also going to be a huge requirement uh, because, of course, combustion engines aren't going to work in vacuum on the surface of the moon. So some real technical challenges, uh, but I'd just like to propose this as uh, the commercial play, uh, piece that Australia could do that is a little bit more long term but needs work uh, beginning right now. Australia is in a unique position to transfer their knowledge base around safe and responsible resource extraction and take it forward out into the solar system. I'd like to think that this is a key capability that space um, Australia can bring to the space table internationally. Thank you.